Okay, the next item is Twin Cities PBS, Leah Hale. Hello, yes, we're here. Good morning. Morning. Morning, everybody. Do we start now? Go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Leah Hale. I come from the Dakota and Diné people. I reside in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I work as a television documentary producer for Twin Cities PBS. I'm going to have my colleague introduce herself as well. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us today. I'm Corinne Wilson. I am an associate producer working at 1904 Media, which is um, collaborating with um, and hired by TPT for this upcoming production. So thank you, um, everyone, for allowing us this time to um, explain a little bit about our documentary and our request that we are asking of you this, this morning. Um, um, so we are in production on a 90 minute documentary. It's a national PBS documentary that we at Twin Cities PBS are producing. And the working title is called The Race to Solve Suicide. And basically we are highlighting about eight to nine stories from across the country. And one of the stories is the warrior movement that was created and founded by the Arley High School young men's basketball team. So um, we have been working on this in conversations with community members here for the past year. Um, some of the participants that we um, have been interviewing the last couple of days and we plan to interview in the next coming days are Zainan Pitts, Patty Stevens, Anna Sorrell, and the main youth that we will be part that will be participating to really tell us about the creation of the warrior movement is Greg Whitesell. Um, so we are here this week. We arrived on the 5th and we are going to be here through the 12th. Um, and we have received permission from um, the Lake County Commissioner's Office to film in and around Arley um, at places such as the high school, um, the public schools, um, outdoor basketball um, as well. And yesterday we had a great experience where we filmed on the 4B Bison Ranch with Zane and Pitts, where we conducted his interview there. And we also had this awesome experience of um, recruiting a powwow dancer, a young men's traditional dancer, and um, an awesome singer, a local singer to Arlie Sean, Sean Dean Peet. So we were able to get some nice evening um, at the shots with um, just to embody the culture that um, Arlie has to offer. So um, why we're here today is we are um, looking to film at Strawberry Hill. Um, I believe we posted the coordinates of the area um, in our request that we sent a couple last week. And um, what we're trying to do is um, capture, what we're trying to do is um, follow Greg Whitesell and his friend Darshan Bolin another member of the Arley High School basketball team. And even though they graduated, were, um, were, they were the ones that were kind of the key members in forming this um, awesome um, empowerment group for young people. So we are focusing on their story and we're, they're going to be in a more or less reminiscing about 2017 and what was taking place in the community in regards to the cluster suicides that were happening. But um, where our lens, what we're trying to point, point at is the idea of resiliency and how people are trying to find um, strength within culture and strength within, um, I guess you can say, things that bring them pride and joy, such as basketball and athletics. So um, we're going to be following the boys on Saturday the 10th, and we were hoping to get them playing basketball at their favorite courts. And we asked them, what, what is some things that you guys did in high school that you enjoyed doing? Um, we kind of want to capture that experience. And the thing that they said was, we always enjoyed driving to Strawberry Hill. And we liked the view of the, of the town and we really liked um, 
kind of just going up there and, and um, I guess you could say their talks, like being boys and talking about what was happening in their lives during that time. So we wanted to recreate that moment by going to Strawberry Hill. And um, at the time, a couple of weeks ago, we were under the impression that it was under Lake County Commissioner's Office, but they accidentally thought we were talking about a different location. So it turns out it's actually under the tribe's jurisdiction. So that's why we're kind of um, late in coming to you for permission. But um, we definitely would like your support. Um, we want to do our best to capture the community's beauty. And we think that area um, will, will, do, will justify the beauty of, of the landscape and the beauty of just um, the area in general. So what we're, what we're, we, what we're requesting is to come um, on the 10th to arrive at 2 p.m. and we'll probably be finished by 5 p.m. And what we will be doing visually is kind of having the boys um, drive there. And then once they're there, they will get out and walk around. And we will kind of just be like a fly on the wall, filming them, um, filming their conversations and um, kind of them just showing us the area. We also plan to have a drone there, a camera, where we can get like high aerial views of um, the whole landscape as well. So we're really looking forward to it. Um, I'm gonna let my colleague talk about um, permits that we have already purchased in advance. Yes, so thank you again for your time here. We have been planning this for quite a while. So this was a bit of a curveball for us. So really appreciate you um, making space in the agenda for us today. We will have, um, we have already received the conservation permits um, that were, were purchased at a nearby uh, retail location. Every member of the crew has that. I want to also make sure that you know that we, in speaking with Lake County, we've been told that there's no permit required there, but we've gone through the process of that, as well as um, our, our camera operator is licensed with his drones and registered with those. So he is fully aware of all of the um, federal and state regulations required to operate within that space. Um, yeah, but, and oh, and um, we are also using a local drone operator, um, Jordan Jordan Lefner. Jordan Lefner. Um, so we're definitely trying to um, utilize your talent that you ha have here as well to work to work with us. And um, yeah, we just want to um, we just want to express our gratitude for um, just allowing us to be here in general. I've been in conversations with Robert McDonald for the past year. And even though um, we didn't really have our, our prop, the properties that we've been filming at have been private properties like the ranch and this coming week we will be in um, a couple of people's homes and the other places are under Lake County's jurisdiction. But um, we just out of courtesy have been in conversations with um, Robert McDonald just to let him know like what we're what we're doing and um, just to receive his input and advice. So um, he was the person that recommended that we come to tribal council to ask for permission for Strawberry Hill. So um, with that, we just want to, again, express our um, gratitude and appreciation for allowing us time on your agenda. And um, that concludes our request. Are there any okay. questions? Or um, anything we can clarify, please let us know, of course. So just so you know, we got a report this morning that we are in a very high fire danger situation here. So I would encourage you to take um, those proper protocols, um, you know, not leave your vehicles running, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just because there's if it's the strawberry hill I'm thinking of, there's, you know, grass, dry grass up there. So that's the only feedback I have. Um, because we have a lack of filming protocol established currently, um, we're working on that. But uh, we just had this conversation yesterday, um, Rick and I did. So, yeah, with, I guess with a lack of protocol, um, these th things do come before council. So mm -hmm. input from council questions. Madam chair. Go ahead, Anita. Just real quickly. I know of, um, when this, the film 
the one film come out, the Leffler boy had done a tremendous job um, in producing it. And there was quite a few of the then early warriors that participated. And I just wondered if they would be a part of it as well, or is it just the two former students? Right now, it's just the two former students. We did our best reaching out to as many as we could, but um, it was really, I guess you could say a lot of a lot of students are were either in school or they're working, so a lot of them just didn't have the time to to do it. So we were we were really trying to get as many as we could, and it's the only two that we were that are up for up for it. Um, but definitely, um, Jordan's Lefner's his. We are also planning on um, acquiring um, past high school basketball game footage because we just love what he has captured um, over the years. And we're going to definitely, um, he's going to create like this, this reel of footage that he has um, in particular that year, 2017. And then we're going to pick and choose the, um, the footage that we want. And then we're going to make an agreement and, and, um, um, acquired that footage for him so but yeah I agree I would have loved to have um, many more participants um, youth participants young men but those were the only ones that were able that were that were willing to to participate well it's been also a tricky time just as far as gathering folks in general this is this project has been <laughs> a bit delayed for um, for obvious reasons um, this past year but we're out here safely and we are working with um, some really great folks who have been really enthusiastic. So um, we're looking forward to some really beautiful filming days ahead of us. Yes, and then um, in addition, we are following strict COVID protocols as well. Um, our whole production team, we have a small production crew. There's about um, five to six of us and we don't all go out at once. Um, we kind of only send the, the people that are necessary. And um, we have all been vaccinated. Um, we're still wearing masks. We're still um, definitely sanitizing um, everything that we come into contact with. So, um, and we're, we've been doing our best to um, work with as many vaccinated folks as possible, as possible, but we understand that those are, there, there's a few that haven't been vaccinated. So we're definitely um, social distancing and making sure that we're doing our best to keep everyone safe filming outside and making sure just um, following the protocols that TPT has in place is, is pretty okay. sweet. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would make the motion to allow them to, I guess, film in RLE um, and just with the request, uh, leave it better than, than you found it. Thank you. Okay, and this is for the Strawberry Hill site. Motion by Martin, second by Bing. Any questions? Can't see Anita. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, Thank you so ladies. Thank you so much. Wopi da tanka pidami ayapie. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And um, we will do our best to leave it as squeaky clean as possible. <laughs> no trace of us. <laughs> Thank you so much. All righty. Good luck, ladies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would we get a permit? Oh, one more question before we leave. Is it possible for us to have something in writing? Um, just a, even a short email that says that we, we spoke and that we we're allowed to be in the space. We would hate to have anything happen. And, um, and folks to be concerned and us to not have a little paperwork to back that up. Yes, Jennifer Trahan can follow up with you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Patricia. Her information is on page nine in the packet. Good morning, Patricia. Yeah. Good morning. I don't, I can't see the pack it um go away auntie's working i'm sorry i'm outside with kids um i had put the request in to close for i think four hours uh to do a health and wellness uh barbecue with the dhrd 
What day? What times? I, I don't have my cell phone. Work cell phone, Shelly, is dead. And I don't have, I can't access that on this particular phone. I'm sorry. I'm on PTO and I'm, I'm just doing this call. And I apologize to each one of you for that. I can't see the can't see the um the packet yeah no. i can't it's not pulling up and again i'm sorry clayton do you have that information uh no i do not right off hand uh so um if we could uh if i could suggest maybe patricia we could provide that with the council uh by email uh okay. today the specifics um, that would be helpful. Martin. Um, Patricia, who on your staff is coordinating this? Um, uh, Corky and myself, and um, I won't be back until Monday because um, I'm back home doing paperwork again. So could we maybe have uh, Corky or somebody uh, let us know? Yes, I can do that. If you give me, I didn't know that I wouldn't be able to see it on this phone. So um, I will text him and ask him if you want, if you can let me come on later, I would be more than happy to do that. Um, and then I can present it more competently. Yeah, let's revisit this so we know that we have staff coverage and proper notification out to the membership. So okay. um, how about if you come back at one o'clock? Okay, that sounds fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Next up, we have Seth. Good morning, Seth. Chairwoman, fine. Council members, um, I have a contract request before you, but briefly, I just wanted to mention one thing related to rehab and betterment of the project and uh, and where we're at at the moment. Um, I wanted you to be aware that Appendix 3.6 of the compact identified the tribal priorities for rehabilitation and betterment. This was something when uh, uh, in years past 2014, we took to the council a number of times actually. Um, and I just, we are now with, if you choose to advance the contract I'll bring before you, we will be working on at the engineering level and design level, the top four tribal priorities, which one is to place the irrigation project canals and pipelines. And as you may be aware, we're doing that in the Jocko Valley. The benefit of that is it benefits the irrigators, but it's a water conservation measure to save water to put back in the rivers. We are working uh, diligently at the Jocko K Canal. The design is done, the permits are under review, and soon I'll have a fairly large construction contract to bring before you. And then the, the one I have before you today is the engineering work at the North Fork Jocko Tabor Feeder Canal intersection and the Jocko Upper S Canal, both of which we are trying to rehabilitate the structures while significantly improving fisheries issues. So we are, we're trying to be faithful to that, that um, history of council direction on that. Um, what I have before you today is on page 10 of your sheet. Um, and what I'm requesting is to execute a contract with Macmillan Jacobs Engineering in the amount of $300,000 to initiate work at, we call it the the Tabor Feeder Canal North Fork Jocko site area because the work would occur at that large diversion. It would occur on the concrete canal if you take the twin feeder road along the canal and it would occur at the upper S canal. It would also include restoration and rehabilitation of, of lands damaged during, uh, 
during construction of the irrigation project, basically. Um, this particular site is, was constructed in 1924 at the North Fork Jocko Diversion. So um, what I request, and the contract we would execute with McMillan Jacobs is a non-competitive contract. Dan Lozar brought this before you on uh, in March 9th, 2021 as a project to advance and an opportunity for non-competitive negotiations. It will be a large engineering contract, but I would like to manage it as allowing them specific tasks. So we'll come in for modifications and that, that just keeps, I, I like to do it that way because it keeps the engineering firms on their toes and, and aggressively working for their client, the tribe. So um, McMillan Jacobs did is done the engineering design work at Jocko K Canal and our fisheries program and all tribal staff have been really pleased with their work and uh, their attention to detail and, and fisheries issues in, in addition to irrigation. So um, the, uh, the resolution I would request would be to enter into a contract with McMillan Jacobs Engineering in the amount of $300,000 to initiate engineering design work through the preliminary engineering level at the North Fork Jocko River Tabor Feeder Canal planning area. And certainly entertain any and all questions, yeah. Madam Chair, I'd make the motion to approve the contract with me. Okay, we have a motion by Martin to approve the contract. Second by Mike. Questions? All those in favor? Okay, motion carries unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Seth. Thank you very much for your time. Yep. Have a good day. Yep. Okay, next up we have a uh, <clears throat> security discussion with Rick, Clayton, Craig, and Jim. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Council. Uh, I, I believe this uh, can be a relatively short <clears throat> uh, conversation. I just wanted to um, provide an update on uh, what we have been uh, working on uh, related to uh, adding a formal security option for the, the tribes. And um, potentially get a little bit of uh, direction. Um, we all, uh, I think, remember the, I, I can't remember how long ago it was now, but uh, the, the threat that um, kind of brought to the forefront the need for a, a formal and organized uh, response to security concerns and yeah, I think uh, th this is fine in open session. Um, the uh, in in response to that, uh, I've been um, working with uh, Craig and uh, Clayton. Uh, Craig from the law enforcement side, uh, Clayton as the um, the head or the the organizer of. Uh, what we uh, have previously had in place, a uh, security uh, kind of a working group. Uh, it's been several years since it's been very active. And then uh, Jim Steele as, uh, as a former security officer and um, actually serving in a security role in the sergeant at arms uh, position. Um, so uh, we have um, we have a, a kind of a general 
uh, plan of uh, attack that we would like to bring forth, but we need a little bit of direction. So bef before I ask for the specific direction, uh, we 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 generally like the idea of uh, formalizing an office, a security office that would be uh, responsible for taking all aspects of security into their umbrella, either through coordination with departments such as IT and facilities or by um, directly having those responsibilities transferred. Um, and uh, we're starting to see some of the benefits of that with the security team that is in place at DHRD uh, with the fire drills and the uh, the exit maps that uh, you may or may not have seen um, around the complex area. And um, and so we're even in this interim period kind of working, still working to expand what we do have and uh, keep those safety measures in place. But we have a decision point <clears throat> and that is um, what kind of what does security uh, look like? And so this is a, kind of a conceptual question for council that we'd like some direction on. Um, security can mean officers patrolling. It can mean uh, severely restricted access and um, a team to monitor those things. So doors that should be locked or that are employees only remaining locked, um, kind of going somewhat similar to COVID protocols with you know separate entrances, similar to what you might see in a, a federal government building or, or something like that. Or um, it can involve uh, using technology in, in a more, uh, I would say, passive but not necessarily less effective way. Um, for example, um, using our camera system to uh, to monitor uh, access in, into certain areas but without needing to have uh, a physical presence. So the question is um, basically what <laughs> which end of the spectrum uh, would council like us to focus on because they require significantly different, I guess, skill sets and uh, budgetary concerns and um, the, the mission statement of the security team will be driven ultimately by the, the direction here. So um, any, any thoughts, happy to uh, defer to any of the other folks here um, that would want to share any additional comments, but that's the 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 gist of this conversation, and um, just looking for general feedback. Len, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council, and and um, thank you, Rick. I I really appreciate you coming in and discussing this with us. I I really support the idea of. Um, creating or developing a security department and um, that that oversees every aspect of security that we need here especially here right here in the chambers I mean I, I would like to I would like to see um, <clears throat> um, security personnel just uh, continually continuously monitoring and, and uh, patrolling the complex amongst our, as well as our other tribal buildings. And um, also in regards to um, cameras, I mean, I think, I think that's, if we're gonna be successful, that's gonna be one of the most important um, tools that we're going to, that we're going to need here um, uh, through, throughout the headquarters here because as I understand it, uh, we're, we're, we're really limited right now on what they can monitor. And, you know, just based on the, the last couple incidents that took place here, um, you know, if we can get a, uh, 
a camera or a surveillance system set up here where we can see every inch of the property. I mean, I think that would be that would be making not only our our employees but um, our membership more um, secure when they when they're having to come over here and do business, conduct business here. So. I, I really like the idea. I support. I, I, I support um, this moving forward. So, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Anyone else? I'd just like to say that um, you know my biggest concern is the public safety. Um, we've had visitors with um, that were under the influence of one substance or another. Um, we've had people with mental health issues. Um, I get nasty grams on my voicemail all the time from one individual in particular. And um, I'm kind of fearful to see that person in, you know, in person. And I would hate for him to come to the office and, you know, um, just have a little outburst or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, in that regard, I guess, you know, I I would like to see some in-person patrolling. I think we can do a lot with cameras, but I think that that restricted access maybe is not a bad idea. Um, I know I've come here. I've come here on Fridays, and the doors are supposed to be locked. And um, the individual that I was meeting just walked through the front door. And when I came out to meet him, he was already in. The door wasn't locked. And so, you know, I think we need to set up our protocols and and strictly adhere to them. I've had people working upstairs um, in the past that have called me and said. You know, there's, I'm here, I just want to make sure I'm not the only one here. Somebody just walked up the stairs, you know, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, that restricted access is an issue. Um, and I would like to see us develop further protocols as far as um, what to do if there's a bomb threat or what our fire drill procedures look like. Um, because right now, I think we're, not everybody is on the same page as far as that. Jim, did you have something to add? Yeah, all of those things that Rick <clears throat> Rick mentioned mentioned are, are uh, the most important parts of security. Uh, you have several different types of security. Got your cameras. You got individuals sitting static at a bench, on a bench or on a desk. You have others that walk around in uniforms. And you know the most important thing that I found is that. Uh, we had a limited staff, and it was pretty much an experiment. And there was myself, and I hired two other officers under the DHRD program. Um, and uh, we set up the protocols ourselves for the safety of the. I wanted to limit it to the tribal complex area, the new building and the older buildings. So we did that, and we did walk arounds. I had access to all of the cameras on the reservation, and particularly the tribal council chambers. I had access to those cameras. And we had a list of those who created havoc in the chambers on occasion. And I monitored those cameras very closely, if not coming over in person. I would uh, identify if one of those individuals happened to be coming toward the council chambers, and I would come over and deal with it outside the chambers. So we, we were managing to do that. Uh, so we had a list of several different things. One of the things that I can put Craig on, he, he had some training downstairs one day, and he in mentioned to one of the officers, uh, security officers, that since we started at that time, this in 2013, uh, the calls to the complex uh, were reduced by 75% by the regular street officers. And the original intent behind that, uh, developing a security uh, force, so to speak, uh, uh, was to do just that. The officers need to stay out on the street, stay available for the community out there as much as possible. And we were able to handle some of the smaller details, if you want to refer to them as that. 
smaller but more serious. And we, because of our experience, myself and two of the others, we were able to determine what was security and what was law enforcement. We had a situation, if we had a situation where I felt like law enforcement needed to be involved, we'd do a report, we'd get it to them, we'd make a call, they'd come in. And we'd only call them if it was necessary and if we felt that law enforcement needed to have an active presence. That worked out really well. I don't have the number of reports I did, but there's a stack of them. We did a report on every incident. Sometimes we'd have 25, 30 in a week, but we recorded them all. We also did a questionnaire of all of the people in the complex. We did a hand handout questionnaire and we asked them to return it. And it was overwhelmingly in support of continuing with our security program as it existed. We would patrol the buildings in uniform. We'd go talk to the people, say, hey, we're here, you know, and just walk by. Your presence is more of a deterrent than anything else. Your appearance in uniform is a deterrent more than anything else. You can't just walk around with, with civilian clothes on and tell somebody, hey, you stop and get knocked down, you know. <laughs> I mean, that really does occur. I hate to make a joke out of it, but... We had all kinds of uh, physical problems with the building, facility problems, I should say. The doors in the back, this door's always been bad. The one back by the smoking door, the one by, and those have never been really corrected. Um, I'm just giving you sort of an overview. Uh, these problems actually, uh, most of the problems that I that I uh, identified here are, have already been dealt with. My, one of our main concerns was, is, is uh, people not wanting to go out the main door and they would prop open the side doors, the non-exit and entrance doors with rocks and whatever else you could find. We managed to handle that situation, but uh, it continues, I know, even today, with our new, our new situation here with having the door monitors there, although they're not security personnel, their presence alone actually helps deter a lot of this. We have them scheduled for training. One of the things I'd like to compliment Leroy, because he, you know, he asked me, "What should we do?" I said, "Just do what you think is right." Let's just here's these are some of the things we did, and we didn't, or we tried to accomplish, and we didn't quite get it done. So he, on his own, with his officer, he's gone around and, and developed some different uh, access points and protocols, evacuation routes, and those sort of things, and identified all of the uh, uh, EMT type. Uh, information that we needed. He's got a good rapport with uh, pretty much everybody in the complex. We expanded our patrols to the airport where they have uh, uh, an office there for, uh, and then they have an area where they secure a lot of uh, material and equipment, huge, huge equipment area. We patrol lightly with the uh, fish and game, but they, you know, they have armed officers there, so we didn't spend a lot of time there. Um, NRD, we set up cameras there, and we had, actually had a desk there with a, a security officer present. And because of the way things went, we had to pull that person. But anyway, vendors were another thing. And we, we couldn't deal with that because they said, we well, can't be, they want to come in and sell stuff, let them go. Well, I had one kid come in with a red box, walked right past me and went back to the main offices and I went back and I intercepted him and he he had uh, some items in there to sell, but he also had some unlawful stuff in there that I turned over to the police. So anyway, the overview that Rick gives you, has given you is really critical. We do need, it needs, if a security office is developed, it needs to be independent. And it has to be hand in glove with law enforcement, which it was very, very well. We worked very well with law enforcement, but it has to be independent with their own offices and also maximum camera access. Right now, Leroy's got access to maybe four cameras. I don't have access to any cameras because that's not my role at this point. My role is to, to protect the council and then do my job here. But, Anyway, I have a list of things if you guys want to look at it. These are from 2013. These are things that we identified and dealt with, and hopefully they've gone away now. But I see a, an attitude out there amongst some of the ones that uh, uh, 
chairperson <laughs> Shelley had to deal with. I had to intercept one. I had to put on my security hat last week, I think it was, and talk to an individual that was trying to come into the building. He actually was 86 twice out of here. And I told him, don't come in. I didn't really have the authority to do that under my current role, but I didn't want somebody coming in here and harassing the staff. And I won't do it now, even if I'm a civilian walking around. It's just the way I operate. But anyway, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but I would like to see us have our own offices, our own access, our own camera access, and fully trained individuals. We have a training program set up already. It's It's been uh, on hold since 2013, but I'd like to reactivate that, and if we could do that, and uh, Rick's got some excellent ideas on, on how to implement this, and, and I have a lot of respect for his opinion, so. Whatever he chooses, I'd like to go along with it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Any other concerns from council? Comments? Go ahead, Lynn. It's one other question. So do we have any estimated time frames on on uh, what you're looking at here, Rick? Um, so I think if we if we get the approval for um, I guess I, I, before I answer that, I want to clarify. So the the question was really um, physical presence versus um, yeah. other measures that you know could facilitate um, facilitate meeting the needs, but without the physical presence. And what I'm hearing is physical presence is kind of there's a preference for that, uh, at least to some degree. Um, but I, I don't want to make assumptions. And so I'm, and the reason I'm kind of bringing this back up again as a question is because it, the timeline really depends on what, what version we take. Uh, in either case, what we would be looking at is, um, uh, rolling in what we already have and there's some budgetary and programmatic restrictions that are in place that we'd have to overcome that are relatively easy to overcome with the DHRD security presence given how they're funded and so we'd have to get a little bit creative but uh, we could very relatively quickly in the next um, within the next month at minimum um, or maximum start to make that um, more of a presence, not just at a DRD, DHRD level, but within the complex area. Um, the, the, the next kind of big hire would be a director, somebody who could come in and take all of those other components because even with the physical presence, um, that coordination across all of the different aspects of what we do is a critical piece. Um, so what we would be uh, looking at is uh, potentially an RFP uh, for a contractor to come in and sort of get that up and running or um, up and running as in uh, help develop the protocols so it's easier to make sure we have the, the person who can do all of those things, um, makes the hiring process easier or we would look to just hire and sort of build it out uh, organically. Um, in in either case, I think the with council's blessing on the physical presence piece, we can start running. If council doesn't want to do the physical presence piece, it actually makes it probably a little bit harder because then we're looking for we're looking for that coordinator before anything is like significantly different than it is right now. I, I, I rambled a little bit, but hopefully that kind of made sense. Charmel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the topic, definitely. I think we all appreciate the topic. Um, and and I guess in light of our discussion that we had yesterday about, you know, our priorities and, and um, economic development, jobs, internal, external, do we create, do we support? That's that's where my headspace is right now. 
I think um, I'm also curious if we feel like we have an adequate threat assessment to base these decisions upon and um, the scope of our focal point right now. If it's reservation wide, tribal owned, governmental occupied buildings, and then how do we either integrate or complement or work with existing um, security staff, like for example, the tribal health as, as well. I, I, I don't know. So, you know, I definitely appreciate the topic and um, those are some of the gaps in my understanding right now. Thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me, threat assessment is a, that's a good question. Um, Craig, and, and, and I can send it out to council. I didn't want to get the cart before the horse, um, but there was a threat assessment uh, performed by the security group, which included uh, Clayton and Craig. Uh, was that 2016 or 17, Craig? You're muted. Not sure the exact date on that, but there was an assessment done. And I think that if, if I may, the a coordinator position would would be the person who would do all of that that Councilman Gillen had talked about. They would be the one who would put all that together and give us the idea of what we need for security. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, I think the 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 gist of the threat assessment was there is a a need it. And that's why I keep talking about the, the two extremes because it really comes down to preference and sort of the feel of the environment that you create, which is different. You know, we're used to an open kind of as frustrating as it might be to the person or to the security personnel. Um, there, there is a, there's a norm, a value that is um, part of you know, not having a security presence that you have to pass through. And that's really the, the big question that uh, will, will drive the next step. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair, Go ahead, just Jim. a quick, uh, I'd like to address uh, Councilmember Gillen's question. Uh, when we initiated this process, those are some of the things that we put into place. Um, and one of them was is that, you know, we looked at the, we had a meeting here with all of the departments, including the college and the tribal health. And uh, my preference at the time when I when they asked me to propose it, Clayton, Clayton Matt was the first one to ask me to put something together. And I was working in DHRD for Arlene at the time. And one of the things that I, I suggested at the time was that, hey, let's concentrate on the tribal complex. Uh, there was an MOA or MOU developed with that was pulling all of the security divisions into one place. I said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. We want to concentrate on the complex only. And an MOA was developed and it had my name in it and it was sent to me and I corrected it and I was told it wasn't supposed to be corrected. I said, well, I won't have my name on that if you're going to continue with it the way it is. That's old history. But one of the protocols that we we developed was that, you know, uh, we stay out of tribal health business. We stay out of the tribal uh, colleges business. They got their own program. We concentrate all of those, on all of those buildings that don't have any security coverage at the moment. We actually took one of our GSA vehicles and we decorated it up with stickers and I got in trouble for that. But yeah. You know, we, they stayed on there. And we patrolled all of these areas and made contact with people daily. And they really appreciated it. In fact, when I'd come in just to visit, people were saying, oh, did you start security again? I said, no, no, no. But there, to address the issue of cameras and other technology versus physical presence, I think a combination of both was already identified. We did both. If we had, if I had an officer out on the street patrolling, we had radios. Nice. Well, they were they were limited in their distance, but they they functioned. I would call one of the guys. Hey, you need to go over to the trailer. They have an issue over there. Go take care of it. And we'd get on the cameras and we'd be able to see what's going on. 
And so, and, and we, and when we identified it as a law enforcement issue, we called law enforcement. They were right on the spot. We had a lot of them at the service station where uh, we had at least three particular people that just didn't seem to want to pay attention. And as far as access to the buildings, we used to go around right after everybody left the buildings. We'd check all the doors, make sure they were locked. Sometimes we'd, <laughs> we'd get somebody sleeping on the couch outside here and we'd go take care of that problem. But those things went away, particularly since uh, we were a, a presence, a physical presence, and they didn't know when we were going to be there. And that's the key, you know, alternate your schedule. And uh, Craig has really been supportive of it in those days, and we really tried really hard to, to make sure that we followed protocols that we're, we, we, we developed ourselves. It's just common sense. If it's a law enforcement issue, stay out of it. You call the police, give them what we have, and they'll run with it. And uh, we stumbled on a couple of those. On, it was my fault, but uh, we took care of things. Anyway, I suggest that, you know, the combination of both would probably work, but, you know, whatever can happen. Mike? Well, I'm kind of on that same idea, but uh, in Hot Springs, we've had a break-in at the senior center just last fall. It would have been nice to have had cameras to at least know what was going on, and Probably the, the most recent security interest in Hot Springs is the bathhouse is being uh, uh, painted by youngsters all the time. And uh, people are breaking in and wondering what they can take out of it. And so there's um, uh, liability risks mostly there, but still security problem. And so that, that uh, a, a physical presence of a fence might take care of part of that, but cameras would help. Okay, anyone else? Um, Madam Chair, I, I think, um, so th there will always be uh, an aspect of physical uh, presence. It's, it's um, really the distinction is the visibility of that uh, because we're going to need some people to be able to respond even if we're fo focusing on cameras. Um, so there, there will be physical aspects. Um, it doesn't, I guess I, I still don't know so maybe consensus, maybe a vote, maybe more information. Um, is there a desire to go to sort of a lockdown um, concept where there's you get screened? And that, that's why I referenced the federal uh, building model. Um, not that we would have to go the full route, but you can't enter a federal building without going through a security checkpoint and is that the direction that council would want to go or are we looking for maintaining some level of the the openness that we have now uh, with the understanding that uh, this security team would be evaluating constantly the the need for physical presence at certain sites at certain times. I mean, that, that, that is essentially the role that they would have is uh, to help determine that. But if we're, but that's different than kind of locking down the facilities and th that's the direction I'm looking for is not, um, I guess the the budgetary implications, all all of it really is so distinct with those two two models, and that's what I'm hoping to get. Whatever council would like to share today. Okay, Ellie. Thanks, Rick. Um, I'm I'm leaning towards B, the not strict lockdown where you have to go through security to get into every building, but I like that um, we would have people available to be checking doors, to 
Um, if somebody's working on a Friday and they feel uncomfortable to know that there's a presence, um, if other issues come up with people kind of wandering around and we're not sure, you know, maybe they look suspicious or whatever the case may be, that there's folks who can just take care of that kind of thing. But that's where I'm at. I like the physical presence. I just don't know about the government lockdown type style. That's just me. I agree. I don't think we're there yet. I mean, I hope I hope a threat assessment doesn't um, indicate that, but go ahead, Charmel. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Rick, the question. Um, I do think that it would be good to have a coordinator, um, you know, somebody to develop a program to have a presence and a reasonable level of, you know, um, security that keeps maintains the openness now but i wonder if we could get equipped to have that uh higher level of screening implemented if there's a perceived threat or maybe we have a dignitary visiting that needs um a higher level of security etc So um, I, I think maybe there's enough head nodding and in agreement here. Uh, what we will do then is um, uh, have the budget uh, prepared to sort of phase this in, um, but we'll work on this uh, coordinator position and um, and and just get started under those general guidelines. When that person is brought in, it'll be similar to a lot of the stuff that council's been doing now. There'll be policies that are going to be developed um, as part of this that'll need council approval. Uh, but I feel like we have direction at kind of how to help guide them. Um, one, guide the hiring, two, guide the, uh, the policy setting uh, framework. So thank you for that. And that's all we had this morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next presentation is at 11 o'clock. That's the enrollment committee. So let's take a break until 11.
Is enrollment coming in in person? Okay.
Are we waiting for Lawrence? Anita, we haven't started yet. We're still waiting for Lawrence. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I was missing. I could see, see people talking. So if you guys want, we can start with the resolutions. And then um, when Lawrence makes his way in here, we can go over the DNA policy. Okay, we'll go ahead and get um, started with enrollment. Okay. Good morning, Council. So we will go ahead and just jump to um, page 25. Let me bring that down. So uh, this was brought in previously for Felicia Pachette to be relinquished and enroll with um, Spokane Tribe. There was um, some miscommunication with the resolution. So we just need it um, approved again. And that way we can get the signed resolution to Spokane. Can you bring up the resolution on the... Madam Chair. Oh, no. There it is. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chastity, I, I'm not understanding. Is there a difference in the way this resolution is written 
Or was it just the last one we passed didn't get processed? Correct. The last one that we passed didn't get processed. So there's no change in this no at change. all? No change. Okay, I'd make the motion can you, to approve. Can you bring up the bottom of it? Because I think there's yeah. an issue. The certification. So it says 2018? Oh. Yeah, I'll fix that. Oh. So we have a motion by Charmel to approve the resolution with a date correction. Second by Martin. Questions? <clears throat> All I those do, in favor? I do, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Anita. Just real quickly with the reading over these these three, these individuals will not get the upcoming art money, will they? Will, there, will they be relinquished before the 16th? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? I'm sorry, Fred, I didn't get your vote. Are you in favor? Mm -hmm. Motion carries unanimous. Okay, next. Next, we will jump to page 31. And these two resolutions um, I am um, where we're having issues with because of the 18 monies account and these two minors were relinquished from the tribe and so um, I am needing the resolutions to reflect that the funds be directed back to the tribe, which was a correction towards the bottom before the certification. Go ahead, Charmel. Did you just say you noticed the certification date was wrong as well? Yeah. Okay. You need, you um, need will, a little background on this or? No, I, well, I don't. I don't know if council does. I was gonna make the motion to approve the resolution for the removal of Raylena Marie Amen. Um, motion by Charmel, question by Martin. Raylena. Okay. Uh, oh, you want me to do this one? Did you need some background? No? Okay. Go ahead, Lawrence. Can you turn your mic on? Okay, this resolution is for the removal of. Uh, uh, a minor. Uh, we have evidence uh, that was provided that shows that the person that's on the birth certificate isn't the biological father uh, through a DNA. Uh, so we're looking at uh, removing this individual and the IIM funds in that account return back to the tribe. I'm not sure. Well, the person that's on the birth certificate knew, but yet still continued to have this individual uh, be enrolled, even though he knew he wasn't the biological father. Madam Chair, second the motion. Okay, second by Ellie. Any other questions, comments? The only thing I would say is to correct the date and the signature on the resolution. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, motion carries unanimous. We are going to jump to 
page 33, and it is the removal of... Chastity, can you turn on your mic, please? We're jumping to page 33, and it's in regards to the removal of Louis Tracy Jackson. He was relinquished and was looking to enroll into the Nez Perce tribe. This was done back in 1998. Um, it was approved through us. We had sent the resolution to Nez Perce, but they had never gotten us back um, a confirmation stating that he was to be enrolled with them. So he was had dual enrollment. So we recently removed him from our roles last week. Following that, he had two minors that were also enrolled, which would also remove these two children from our roles. And that's the resolution on page 34. Questions from council? Were they both enrolled? I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Go ahead, if Anita. It appears that they're both at a quarter. Was there another parent that was enrolled as well? Um, Madam Chair, uh, one of the things that uh, are required under ordinance 35a is that you have to be born to a member the the previous children before the relinquishment uh, were eligible however when he re requested relinquishment and transferring to nespers and from the time that he was enrolled in nespers the 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 individuals were no longer eligible because he is not really a legal uh, enrolled person with this tribe. So therefore, those children, even though they are a quarter, uh, because of the descendant uh, of Mr. Jackson, make them a quarter. But he, you have to be born to a member of the tribe at the time that they are birth, uh, time of birth. Ellie? Just a question. So is there something in place now to prohibit this from happening in the future where if people are requesting relinquishment there there's a database that includes that information so you can do follow-up so that there's just no pending it, question it, it, it is a difficult situation because uh, let's take uh, Kalispell tribe uh, we have uh, seven seven individuals requesting relinquishment from here to the Kalispell tribe but Kalispell tribe still has their enrollment frozen, so they're still in limbo. And so one of the things that we have uh, in place now that we will periodically check those tribes from our relinquished data uh, to make sure that they don't enroll an individual without notifying us. So we'll, we'll keep abreast of what the relinquishments are being requested and then follow up periodically to make sure that they don't slip through the loopholes again. Okay, Charmel, did you want to um, point out the typos? Thank you, Madam Chair. Not really, but um, I mean, there's some just some minor typos as far as uh, that goes, but there's some major issues um, that I will point out. On the third whereas, it says Louis Tracy Jackson Jr. is the biological father. That's incorrect. I think you're telling us that Louis Jackson, Louis Tracy Jackson Sr. would have been the biological father who was relinquished in 1998. So that would need to be corrected. And then I'm curious about the, the be it further resolved statement. It says it, 
that it shall show Louis Tracy Jackson Jr. as a blood quantum of quarter degree Salish. And then the next, be it finally resolved, says that that same person will be officially removed. And I don't know if that's, if you want both of those statements. They seem, one scene says that this person shall be shown in our official roles. Mm -hmm. And then the next statement says shall be removed. So I don't know if both of those are required or, or correct. Yeah, because, uh, Madam Chair, uh, because uh, under um, under the, uh, Ordinance 35A, Article 2, Section 3B states that you have to be born to a member. When he was already removed, this statement says, even though as a quarter, is not eligible under that statement above. So do we need to add another whereas? because he's not the parent, or the parent isn't enrolled? Just to clarify that, why? I, I, could, uh, I could add on a statement that, uh, that, he, that the person uh, is one quarter, however, does not meet the Article 35, Section 2, uh, 3B. Okay, that okay? would be good, Madam Chair. We'll, we'll put that in there. Okay, go ahead, Charmel. Madam Chair, thank you. Yeah, uh, Lawrence, I think that would fix that, be it resolved. But the question that Madam Chair had about another whereas, I think that's the one that I was suggesting you correct. It it's currently says that Junior is the biological father. If you drop that, then I think it satisfies the whereas that you were referring to because it addresses that then there is no eligible parent for Junior to be enrolled. Okay. Thank you. You got that. And then if you could also correct the certification date and the signature. <laughs> Martin. So has this individual been um, receiving per capita since 98? Yes. Is he getting per capita from Nez Perce too? Mm -hmm. Um, Go ahead, Ellie. Lawrence, this, I guess, would raise a question. Um, is there anything in the policy that states that if people knowingly dual enroll and collect benefits, in the future that there's something yeah I mean, it, it seems it's it's unethical but is there something that can in in i and chastity and irma and us uh, discuss that because when we do the relinquishment uh, uh, re, uh when they fill out the relinquishment request we, we're gonna have to put in a statement stating that not only the tribe would be responsible for notifying us, but they as individual know that the dual enrollment is um, not, uh, you cannot be dual enrolled and it's also their responsibility to notify us when they get enrolled in another tribe. So we will be adding that statement into the relinquishment uh, request that they fill out that uh, they are fully aware that once they get enrolled over there, they have to notify us also. Ellie and then Charmel. And maybe just adding to that, should you continue to take benefits knowingly um, that you're responsible yeah. for a payback of said funds? Or... Yeah, and, and the tribal council could request that the tribal attorneys, uh, you know, file suit uh, either uh, uh, yeah to the tribe that they they transferred to uh, into their jurisdiction and, and, and hold, see if they would hold like we do holds here, if they would hold and replenish that, that amount of 
uh, disbursement that they received under under the dual enrollment. Okay, Charmel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just noticing the um, second whereas doesn't make any sense to me and I can't figure out what you're trying to say with it. It says, whereas a result of an resolution, that was the one I wasn't wanting to correct, a result of a resolution of relinquishment approved in 1998 for his biological father, Louis Tracy Jackson. Then in parentheses, it says CSKT descendant as of June 23rd, 2021, in which he enrolled into Nez Perce tribe, correcting Nez Perce. I don't know what, yeah, it's not a, it's not a complete yeah, it, sentence or thought, and I'm not that sure. That was when we, in it, in it, in it. It's a statement that's that's following up. Is that's when Nespers finally gave us a CIB stating that he was enrolled down there. Yep, yeah, that's when we finally got notified. The, the articulation isn't there. I don't understand what it's saying according to what's written. And I just want to add that you know I know that. Um, it's timely that these probably get approved today, and so I'm hoping that we can get a cleaned up version to approve for you today. Okay. Thank you. So we better get it back in here today. Along with my application under deposit. So what are the wishes of council? Do you want them to bring back the cleaned up version this afternoon? Lynn? Can we just move forward? I would make the motion to approve with corrections. Okay, motion by Lynn to approve resolution. Um, approving the removal of Louis Tracy Jackson Jr. Second by Bing. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Okay. <laughs> Same with Isabella Jackson on page 34. Is there a motion to approve with corrections? Motion by Lynn, second by Ellie. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Okay. Thank we'll you. we'll have a corrected uh, resolution. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Martin. Um, I'll just wait till next time. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. In in regards to the uh, uh, DNA uh, uh, policies for collection. Uh, the attorneys made some recommendations and I just sent it back to them. So uh, we're going to have to hold off uh, to make sure that the corrections that I made uh, are sufficient enough to bring back to council. Okay, so we'll move to page 35, Arlen. Morning, council. Yeah. Can you turn on your mic? Good morning. There you go. Okay, I'm starting with Brad and Ray Pierce's research. Okay, it's requested by Monica Sue Lawson, adoptive mother for Brad and Ray Pierce. I found that Andrew Nomi was actually four fours full blooded, and we have him listed in teams as three fours Cree. And uh, what else? 
else the other correction I find? Oh. So maybe we should go into um, executive